Have you ever wondered why there are so many Chinese created media with such strong Japanese manga and anime influence? Hi everyone, CJ here. This time, we are going to do something a little more lighthearted and look at the relatively short history and evolution of Chinese otaku culture and how Chinese weebs built their nation's pop culture industry. I have done a video about how Chinese culture influenced Japan in the past, so I think it is fair to investigate how Japanese culture influenced China in modern time. By the way, this is going to be quite interesting for some of you who are trying to create an industry out of otaku culture in your own country. Perhaps in countries like Indonesia, Philippines, or even USA. Before I proceed, I would like to give my heartful thanks to all the people who I interviewed for the research of this video. With special thanks to video essayist Accented Cinema. This video is almost a sequel to his video Chinese Animation in Search of a Style. Also, author of Chinese BL Glossary, Hachiko, and a veteran of Japanese anime industry with 20 years of experience working in China, Mimimu. After watching this video, remember to check out their Twitter profiles and channels in the description section. The modern anime industry in Japan was virtually kicked off by Osamu Tezuka in the 1960s. He was dubbed the god of manga and godfather of anime. He first gained fame by creating massively popular mangas, or Japanese comic books, such as Kimba the White Lion, Princess Knight, Blackjack, Phoenix, and many more. He started his studio, Mushi Production, pretty much to bring his best-known creation to TV, Tetsuwan Atomu. In the West, this show is called Astro Boy. But before this anime revolution, Japan had actually been producing their own anime all the way back to 1917. But recent discovery of a short animation of unknown origin named Katsudo Sashin may push the date further back, perhaps even as far as 1907, before the American and European cartoons were even brought to Japan in 1914. Unfortunately, there is no way to verify the purported creation dates of Katsudo Sashin. Across the ditch in China, animation production started a little later. In 1922, a short animated cartoon was created for the advertisement of a Chinese typewriter brand in Shanghai. After that project, the animator of that short, Wan Leming, and his brothers went on to create more animations. Fast forward to 1941, the Wan brothers ended up creating the first animated feature in China. Princess Iron Fan. Interestingly, this film made its way to Japan despite the wartime strife. It went on to inspire the Japanese Naval Ministry to create their own full-length feature film, Momotaro Sacred Sailors. But one brother's film also made a lasting impression on a young boy who will one day revolutionize the Japanese animation industry, Osamu Tezuka. So here we can see that the cross-pollination between Chinese and Japanese animation happened since a long time ago. After the war, the Chinese Ministry of Culture established the Shanghai Animation Film Studio in the 50s, and the Wan Brothers were recruited to become part of it. The studio then went on to produce most of the classic Chinese animations, many of them under the banner of the 100 Flowers Campaign where the government promoted the creation of arts. When you think about traditional Chinese animation style, it is mostly this studio's work. The 50s and 60s were their golden age. They produced their best works in this era. But it was short-lived. The Cultural Revolution dealt a major blow to them. And they never fully recovered. In fact, this tumultuous period devastated the whole industry. Fast forward to 1972, China and Japan normalized relationship, and in 1978, China launched its reform and opening up policy. Then, as if it was arranged by fate, the first cartoon that China imported to air on TV was Astro Boy. Back then, just like in America, most Chinese children did not know that they were watching a Japanese-produced animation. Eventually, more and more Japanese and other foreign media were imported to fill the vacuum in the entertainment industry. 
Of course, there were regulations that curtailed foreign media in favor of their own domestic production. But it did not stop Japanese media from becoming tremendously popular. Anime such as Doraemon and IQ became household names. And so did TV shows such as Moero Attack, Oshin, and Ultraman. Japan was actually a media juggernaut back then in the Asian region. I am sure some of you watching would also know the titles I just mentioned. Or maybe your parents would, since those are really old programs. Japan was very technologically and economically advanced, so it was quite inevitable that they produced the most successful media in the region, just like how Hollywood dominated the Western media sphere. On another note, what I find to be interesting is that in different countries, certain big three tokusatsus or special effects TV show brands became popular while others languished. In United States, Power Rangers, which is the localized version of the Super Sentai series, is massively popular, while the Kamen Rider and Ultraman series are mostly ignored. In China, Ultraman is king. That's why there were even a group of shady filmmakers who ripped off Ultraman and made a whole movie without license. Meanwhile, in Japan itself, Kamen Rider is the most popular one. I think it would be an interesting experiment if you would comment below and tell me which one is the most popular one in your country and which country you are from. It was only in the late 80s or 90s that Chinese viewers became more conscious of the origin of Japanese produced media, and that was the genesis of the Chinese otaku culture. Back then, the Chinese economy was less than one tenth the size it is today, so there was a lot of catching up to do and Japan provided plenty of model for them to emulate. In China, they are officially recognized as the ACGN subculture, or the Animation, Comic, Games, and Novels subculture. In the early 2000s, the first crop of Chinese animation emulating the Japanese anime style started to appear. Today, if you look at Bilibili's animation offerings, most of the hosted series emulates the Japanese anime style. Bilibili is one of the biggest video sharing platform in China, focusing on ACGN contents. Some people had described it as the YouTube of China. However, I think it would be more accurate to say that it is the Nico Nico Doga of China, since the platform was pretty much based on the Japanese video sharing site, Nico Nico Doga. The name of the site also gives away the interest of the creators, since it is the nickname of the protagonist of Japanese anime, a certain scientific railgun, Mikoto Misaka. Video games based on Japanese RPs were also very popular. Some Chinese companies managed to license big titles, but for smaller companies, it is just too expensive to do. So some companies created their own IP with anime aesthetics. Among them was a company called Mihoyo, who created Honkai Impact the Third. After a series of smaller games, they eventually went on to create Genshin Impact and achieved massive global success. What I find to be interesting is that a Chinese company went on to create the heavily Japanese-themed mobile game Onmyoji. It was first intended for the Japanese market, but due to popular demand during testing, it was also released in China too. It became quite popular in a few countries, especially China, but it only received moderate success in Japan itself. In a previous video, I mentioned that the reason for this was probably due to the cultural uncanny valley. It is like Japanese ingredients being prepared by a chef trained in Chinese cooking. The opposite is kind of true with Kingdom, a Japanese manga and anime series about the unification of China by Qin Shi Huang and his general Li Xing. It is very popular in Japan and other countries, but not in China. If you are wondering about the reason why a Chinese company would start producing games for an overseas market, well, the answer is quite simple. Censorship and restrictions. Games need to be approved by the National Press and Publication Administration before they can be released. And sometimes, they would stop issuing game licenses for months. That's why game companies such as Tencent are aggressively pushing to expand overseas. Because the domestic gaming market is just too risky. 
games they have developed for years may be languishing in the approval backlog due to freeze in approvals. So that's why they have to earn their money elsewhere. The web novel culture too eventually emulated the Japanese model. Like many other countries, China also had their own web novel hosting sites, such as Qitian. However, over time, they have adopted a lot of the conventions and tropes common in Japanese web novel culture, such as the isekai, or the reincarnated in another world genre, and also cheat fictions and literary RPGs. They followed the Japanese pipeline of publishing the most popular web novels into proper novels and adapted them into anime. Over time, however, we started to see some innovations in the Chinese ACGN circle, and that is monetization. Boy, do these communists know how to make money. Even though Japan had a more advanced cosplay scene, according to Mimimu, it was the Chinese cosplay scene that successfully monetized it first. Then Japan followed with their own professional cosplayers. The same goes for the web novel scene. The chapters in Chitian are paywalled, forcing the readers to pay to get the latest chapters. That is why some web novelists in China are incredibly rich. Some of them are earning up to the equivalent of 70,000 US dollars a month. Eventually, after years of playing catch up, China came up with some IPs that bear its own distinctive style. In the circle of Tanmei Media, if you don't know what Tanmei or BLs are, they are male homosexual literatures, written mainly for the female audience. The Tanmei and BL genre also came from Japan. Many of the earlier titles in China were set in the present. But due to regulations that banned scenes deemed to be pornography, many titles ended up buried. So various Tanmei authors had to find new ways to get around the censorship. And they did it by lightly camouflaging their work with period piece themes and never showing anything too racy on page or on screen. Ironically, this combination turned out to be a winning formula. Sometimes, limitations like censorship ended up creating innovation. It is like how the Hollywood Motion Picture Production Code led to Alfred Hitchcock's creation of the scene in Psycho, and how the hentai tentacle in Japan was created to get around censorship. As they say in Chinese, 上有政策, 下有对策. Policy comes from above, countermeasures come from below. Of course, I don't support censorship, but I have faith in the creative fire of mankind. Or to be more accurate in this case, womankind. It is mostly the thirsty fujosis, to be honest. In many parts of China, women hold the family purse and makes the purchasing decisions. But even unmarried women have tremendous purchasing power. This phenomenon is called the she economy. In my opinion, they should have called it she economy, which makes it catchier. Anyway, these cashed up women are willing to fund an industry that caters to them. Various researchers have also indicated that they are willing to spend much more on the merchandise of an IP than male fans. That's why more and more media is created to the taste of these women. A popular web novelist have even said that if you can nab the female audience, then you have won the world. Some game developers also have the same opinion. Apparently, given all the purchasing power, women prefer to see pretty boys intensely looking at each other rather than strong independent women. Maybe Hollywood should learn a thing or two here and give the consumers what they really want. Anyway, as it turned out, it is these Tanmei IPs that incorporated a lot of traditional Chinese themes that are becoming quite influential internationally. One of the most popular series, Grandmaster of Demonic Cultivation, have been translated to multiple languages including Japanese. Of course, on the video gaming side, Genshin Impact had tremendous influence too, exhibiting Chinese culture. I guess one lesson that you can learn from this is that if you want to build your own country's pop culture industry, just emulate what works first and make a sustainable business model. Cultural expression will come naturally as you gain the techniques and the industry became sustainable. Some people may argue that these IPs still look very Japanese and anime-ish. But why should you reject influences from other sources? 
since nothing is created independently in vacuum anyway. Japanese animation was influenced by Disney cartoons and even American animation nowadays is borrowing anime aesthetics. I think it is only a matter of time that some unique pieces of work will come out of China. The censorship suddenly doesn't help, but who knows, it may be relaxed sometimes in the future, since everything keeps drastically changing over there anyway. And just before I go, make sure you check out Accented Cinema, Hachiko, and Mimimo's Twitter profiles and channels. Hachiko may release a new book in the future, and Mimimo's a VTuber that specializes in the Chinese animation industry. If you want more contents from me in the year 2023, I will be on my other channel. Don't stop thinking. I'm designing my own tabletop RPG to be kickstarted in this year. So be sure to subscribe to my other channel for more info. Until next time, stay cool my bros!